You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. The Pet Doctor is brought to you by Dog.com. For everything and anything dog, shop Dog.com today for all the top brands. Greenies, Frontline, Kong, Nylabone, Royal Canin, and more. Shop at Dog.com and use the promo code SADDOC, S-A-D-D-O-C, and get $15 off your order of $75 or more. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Winter, what a fabulous time of year. Perfect for grabbing a cup of hot chocolate, donning your Snuggie, delving into a good book with your pet curled up at your feet. And then when you most need it, along comes spring and you're drawn outside to the warmth of the sun. But huh, your pet collar doesn't fit anymore. It must have shrunk. And last year's outdoor wear is just a bit too tight on you. It must be a conspiracy. No, you know what happened. You and your pet are certifiably pudgy. No exercise and snacks in front of the TV have taken their toll. Winter holds many threats to our pet's health, not just the packing on of pounds. My guest today is veterinarian Dr. Jerry Vanek. He's an expert in keeping some of winter's premier athletes, competitive sled dogs, in top form. We'll chat about these canine companions and weekend warriors. Dr. Vanek will also talk about winter safety issues around the house. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. There's a movement afoot, ShoeBuy.com. Join the millions of people who shop ShoeBuy.com's over 400 brands and 500,000 products. Order now and get free shipping and free return shipping. ShoeBuy.com, the world's greatest shoe store. Walk your dog in style and comfort. Enter the code DOCTOR, D-O-C-T-O-R, at checkout and get a 10% discount plus free shipping at ShoeBuy.com. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. Go to PetMeds.com forward slash doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more at PetMeds.com. FTD's network of over 40,000 florists around the world have been creating beautiful handcrafted arrangements for 100 years. Each arrangement is delivered the same day and backed by FTD's seven-day satisfaction guarantee. For a century, people have trusted their most important occasions to the flower experts at FTD. Since Pet Life Radio is all about puppy dogs and flowers, our listeners, that's you, can get a 20% discount on your order. Just go to florop.com and use the code DOCTOR20 at checkout. F-L-E-U-R-O-P dot com, code word D-O-C-T-O-R and the number 20. Attention passengers, please fasten your seatbelts, put your seat bags and sleeping pets in their full upright position, and prepare for takeoff. Pet Life Radio presents Travel Tales, the show where you'll get great travel ideas on perfect places for you and your pet. From Paris to paradise, south of the border to the South Seas, Travel Tales will give you cool tips on fun vacation destinations to travel with your pet, pet friendly hotels, and advice on how to travel safely and happily with your furry best friends. 
So get ready to pack the bags and the bones with your Travel Tales hosts, Susan Sims and Nicholas Veslowski, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Jerry Vanek, I have known you for several years and you are always fascinating to chat with. And I know you love sled dogs. Give us a little bit of background of how you got into sled dog medicine and some of the different sled dog races you've been involved with. Well, Dr. Cruz, it's... um a long story, and so we'll try to keep this very short, but, but it all started in the 1950s, believe it or not, when a, um, a husky wandered into our yard. It was an abused dog that ran away from home, literally. It didn't have the little um, stick with the bag over its shoulder, but it did show up on our doorstep, and so we adopted it. And in the 1950s, at almost exactly the same time, we got our first television set here on the farm, and one of the first shows we watched was the um, three-year series called um, Sergeant Preston. So I sort of I've got this double whammy of um, of a stray husky wandering into our yard to be saved, and uh, and Sergeant Preston on the TV, and the rest they say is history. So that by the time I was in high school, um, I'd have a husky or two and break, broke them in the harness, and. Um, by the time I was in college, I was racing sled dogs and then went off to vet school and put sled dogs aside for a while. And then in 1992, after I'd been out of vet school and um, in part-time practice, also working on graduate degrees in uh, epidemiology, parasitology, I got back into sled dogs from the other end, which was um, being a veterinarian at the races. And so from 1992 until now, I spend a little time on the runners with, with sledded dogs whenever I can, but the vast majority of my time is spent helping other mushers either at their kennels um, or else on the race trail. And uh, that's the, the, the recap of, of my life with sled dogs. Being a Southern California girl and getting into sled dog racing myself, the first race I ever did was the Iditarod, and that's one of the premier races. And before going, I had my own set ideas, and I think a lot of people in the lower 48s who've never seen sled dogs have a wrong impression of these dogs and think that it, this must be one of the most cruel and unusual punishments that you put these dogs and put them out into the vast wilderness. They are cold, they're outside, and this is just one of the most inhumane things you can ever do for a dog. And then I went up there and I was proven so wrong. Can you give me your impression about sled dogs and why it is a wonderful sport? if done right. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, there are quite a number of reasons, but primarily it's just a matter that the dogs really enjoy themselves. Um, and uh, there's a misconception because of the cold. And, and uh, if you dress right, and of course the dogs, if they're dressed right, which means that they have the proper breeding for the undercoat and the outer coat, and they're fed properly and hydrated, watered properly, uh, and of course in good physical condition, um, they, they not only do just fine, um, it is an outlet for um, what they enjoy doing. And, uh, and you can see it then they love it there are times when they get tired but there are times when we all get tired doing what we love whether we're a professional baseball player or tennis player golfer um there are times when when it becomes a little more like work but but even then we still love our work and the dogs are are very much that way these animals are fairly closely related yet to the ancestral wolf so they like to run in packs they like to work as a team as a group and they like to travel long distances and what we're doing is just channeling these dogs innate abilities to do these things um into a a productive um, um, sport. We find this with children. Um, you can let a child throw rocks uh, willy-nilly and break windows and be a vandal. Or you can take that child and you can teach them how to throw a rock in the shape of a baseball um, at a catcher, and, and pretty soon, uh, you know, they're they're playing for um, the Padres or or the Giants or something. And, and that's kind of the way it is with with dogs. You you take their innate ability to run long distances, um, to see the countryside, to run in packs. 
and instead of having them running um, wild in packs, um, uh, you know, destroying uh, uh, domestic animals or whatever, we put them in harness. They all go the same way, and, and their enthusiasm actually gets channeled the same way that we channel our, our own human enthusiasm for the various sports that, that we play. So the dogs love that aspect of it. As far as the cold weather, again, a lot of it is perception. I not only live in northern Minnesota, which is the cold, but to me it's the banana belt, and I actually head north in the wintertime. So in February and March, when my family and most of my um, colleagues are racing to the Gold Coast um, for warm weather and, and golf and tennis, I'm uh, putting on my, my fleece and my down and my wool, and I'm, I'm heading north uh, into the Arctic because, um, because I enjoy it as much as I do. And the reason I enjoy it is because I know how to, how to feed myself, I know how to water myself, I know how to get rest, I know how to wear proper clothes, and, I, and I'm always in good physical condition. I work out um, every day all summer long, riding my bikes and doing exercising. And so it wouldn't be surprising that, that our dogs are exactly the same way. We feed them well, we water them well, we exercise them so that they're physically, um, physiologically prepared for the elements. Um, they're born and raised in those elements. And so, as I said before, we, we take their innate ability and we channel that ability and we do it with, with the proper kinds of uh, food, nutrition, and sleep and um, physical exercise so that they actually enjoy what they're doing. And anything from, far away from being um, uh, unhappy, these uh, dogs are some of the happiest dogs they work with, to the point where Sled dogs are about the only dogs that I practice on, and I do a lot of my practice for free. So it's not as though I support dog mushing because it's some kind of money maker for me. It's, it's a money loser for me, but um, I don't care. It's worth it that I can be with these incredible athletes and help them do what they do best and enjoy watching them do what they do best and then use my medical skills wherever I can to help them out if they happen to sustain an injury while they're doing what they do best. You can hear the enthusiasm in your voice and having been involved in a lot less races than you, but doing the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest and then the John Berrigrees in Minnesota, these dogs just can't get enough of this racing. They are so excited. They're bouncing, they're jumping, they're barking, all those things that let you know this is a happy dog. And I think a lot of people don't realize that there is truly this bond that goes on between the musher and his dogs. It's not just a kennel of dogs and they don't know them. They know all their personalities so well. And I think that's one thing that people don't realize that it's not just a business for them. This is a real passion and a love for them. But having this passion and love, how do we as maybe owners of dogs in North Dakota, man, it's getting cold. How can people keep their dogs interested during the winter and keep some of that weight off? What activities are available for them? Well, just about everything that's available for human beings. And, of course, the whole idea is is to get out with your dog. And, and studies have shown where they've actually been able to track dog behavior and determine whether or not, say, a, a person with heart disease is actually following their, their own physician's recommendations because they might be saying, yes, they are, or no, they're not. And what scientists have done is actually put pedometers on dogs, and then the dogs tell the truth by means of looking at the pedometers to see whether or not the dogs are actually covering the miles that the human beings are supposed to be covering when when they go for walks and so uh, dogs have actually become a, an, an indicator for for human health in that small way um, and basically what we do is is we, we we find out what we like to do and we just we just dress properly for it and and we take our dogs along and so that can be walking uh, and it, it can be jogging and you can certainly jog in the winter time the only concern there would be of course the wind chill um, more of a problem for humans than for dogs the second problem would be um, any iciness and of course that's an equal problem for dogs and humans you don't want the human or the dog slipping on ice if you're if you're jogging on those kinds of conditions in terms of footwear uh, we can talk a little bit about booties for dogs which would be somewhat similar in their purpose to uh, the humans wearing their jogging shoes when when they jog for folks that like to uh, ski cross-country skiing is an excellent way of introducing your dog some trails don't allow dogs on them but other trails do and those trails that do encourage ski joring and ski joring is a um, a Scandinavian term meaning to be to be pulled by something 
And uh, some people are pulled by dogs uh, on their bicycles in the summer and if it's not too hot. And in the fall, which is ideal, some people are pulled by horses or pulled by you know, snowmobiles on their skis. Um, ski joring with dogs, of course, is the most commonly um, understood and, and appreciated one. And that's where a person goes out with one or two dogs on their cross-country skis. And um, they hook the dogs uh, in front, and uh, the, the dogs pull them along. Or if the dogs are not familiar with pulling and have yet to be trained to pull, they simply jog along beside the person while they ski. And so the dog is, is moving as the, as the person is skiing. Snowshoeing is another way. If you get out with uh, your snowshoes and you're in an area where, where, where dogs are allowed and your dog is, uh, can be controlled by voice, it's a little hard to, to snowshoe with a dog on a leash. But, but if you've got a, a, a dog that will come when it's called, and uh, uh, will we'll not be nosy around the neighbors and, and stay with you and is rather well disciplined that way. You can take your dog snowshoeing and uh, go as far as, as you would go on snowshoes um, uh, with your dog. So there's, there's, there's quite a number of ways that you can do it without actually having to be a full-blown musher. There are kick sleds which are small sleds that are imported from Europe, and they're very, very common over there. And when I go to sled dog races in Europe, I see kick sleds. These are small sleds that, that people push like coasters. No dogs are involved. And what they'll do is they'll put their groceries on their kick sled when they kick back from the grocery store to their home, or they might put their briefcase on it and kick sled their way to work. They might put their kids on it and kick sled the kids off to daycare um, or to elementary school. And then the next logical step is they'll take their pet along and the dog will trot along with the leash, and eventually, of course, it'll start to pull. As you know, some folks will take the dog for a walk on a leash, and, and if the dog is not obedience trained, the dog is already dragging the person down the street, and the person is wishing the dog wasn't dragging him. Well, the next step is, instead of dragging the dog by the neck, why put not put him work. in a harness? Put him in a harness and let the dog drag you down the street, and pretty soon you've got a sled dog. Then all you need to do is add skis or a small kick sled, which you can you can buy on the internet. You can find them, and a lot of folks will get started that way with the small kick sled, and um, and pretty soon they'll have a, a dog or two or three, and. And unfortunately, um, it gets to be a bit addictive because it is such a fabulous um, sport. And, and I can't count the number of people who got a, um, a pretty little Siberian Husky puppy because they thought it had lovely blue eyes. And they got addicted to mushing, and pretty soon they own a kennel with 60 dogs. And, and they're, they're working double shifts during the summer so they can have their winters to mush. And uh, I know one fellow, he years ago in college, they told him, get a dog and walk it along the beach, and you'll be sure to pick up girls. Well, he's still <laughs> single. He's in his 60s. But he's got a kennel of 100 sled dogs. And so obviously, it's still quite picking work up out. girls? Yeah, no, <laughs> nope, not even picking up girls. He's just focused on his kennel and he's, he's, been, uh, he's won a number of awards and things. But, and so, yeah, you start out small with, with your dog and, and you do what you and the dog enjoy doing and you just keep taking it to the next step. You know, if the dog wants to go a little faster, then you can jog. Well, maybe you can try cross country skiing. Eventually, you can buy the belt. There's an actual ski drawers belt that does protect the person's kidneys and it's similar to a mountain harness where where a couple of the straps go around the upper thighs and into the groin and and that protects the person's body because because dogs are a lot stronger than people think and if a dog gives you a good jolt um, on your back uh, it, it can hurt a little bit, so it's good to get your with a proper um, harness uh, for the human and not just tie the dog to your, um, your, your belt loops because uh, I guarantee you, you'll have a slip disc if you've got a good strong dog. But it doesn't have to be a good strong dog either. There is nothing wrong with going out and skiing alongside your, um, your little dog, um, provided the dog can handle the snow. Their, their coat's not too long and, and, their, and their, their feet are not too sensitive. Um, obviously, and 20 below is not good for a chihuahua, but, um, but a Pomeranian would do a little better. They've got, they've got a little more hair. How small of a dog can you have out there for something like skijoring? Because you were just talking about a Pomeranian, in my mind thinking, okay, maybe the smallest would be right. a Labrador or maybe even a Cocker Spaniel, but something as small as a Pomeranian, you could Well, you could certainly, with? you know, I mean, they're, obviously they're not going to pull you. They're much too small for that. And depending okay. on the snow conditions, their hair is rather fine, even though it's, 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 more, it's Arctic-like. A Pomeranian does come down from the spitz breeds, like the, like the Samoyed or Samoyed. Or the or the Siberian Husky or Chukchi, but um, but their hair is a little bit finer. It can ball up with snow, and of course that's when the great thing about the palm is then you pick it up, put it under your armpit, and you've got one warm arm as you're as you're skiing along. But no, palms are a little small for ski joring, and I was I was exaggerating a bit just just to prove a point. But I think you're right in in the range of of the Cocker Spaniel. 
and and you want to go more by height. Of course, the dog has to be comfortable with the snow depth because you don't want them plowing through snow. That's no fun for human or dog. But if it's a hard packed trail, um, uh, a deeply or a, a hard packed snow covered um, sidewalk. Um, you can you can get by with a fairly small dog. Dachshunds, of course, uh, are are a, are a large dog on tiny little legs, just like a basset hound. So they would have a little more difficulty because of their leg length. Um, and getting back to the cockers and the Springer spaniels. Unfortunately, our society has been getting a little bit chubbier, both in terms of humans and dogs, and so we have to be a little careful, even with those medium-sized dogs, that, that these are dogs that are, that are brought into conditioning for this. If, if a person now has a dog where the veterinarian is encouraging them to go on one of the many commercial weight loss diets to get more exercise because their dog is overweight, then once again, as with the human being, we don't want to just take that dog out and run them really hard. You know, When people start working with their various Nautilus machines and, and exercisers, the, uh, the salesman always says, the first thing you do is check with your physician, make sure that you're healthy enough to take up this new activity. And we as veterinarians say the same thing about our dogs. Make sure before you go out and cross-country ski 20 miles with this little 150-pound Cocker Spaniel, make sure that your veterinarian okays it and, and, and that this dog is, is, um, is ready to start exercising in terms of its heart and liver and kidneys, etc. And then um, start out slow and, and, and hopefully the pounds will start to melt off as the dog um, develops its musculature and its cardiovascular system right along with the, uh, with the owner who's developing his or her cardiovascular system and, and musculature and, and, uh, and, and the dog and the human side by side both benefit from these, these outdoor winter activities, the fresh air and the, the brisk cool uh, temperatures. Dr. Vanek, you mentioned something very important, nutrition. And oftentimes people say, oh, it's just a little winter weight. You know, they they need that extra insulation to keep them warm during the winter. And since most of these dogs are spending their time indoors, we know that's not really true. But they think of the sled dog that's out there and is running, especially these uh, ultra marathoners doing the thousand mile races. I'd love to have you chat a little bit about what they're eating, the number of calories that they're burning, just as, you know, a bit of information background and then ways that we can kind of cut back and treat our own pets. So, yes, watch what they're eating. But the, the competitive sled dogs, what are they eating and how many calories per dog? Well, these dogs are eating a tremendous amount of food. It depends, of course, on the race activity. At the one extreme, um, the, the, the sprint dogs are, are not eating a, a great deal more because they're, they're sprinting as fast as they can, but they're only running um, three or four or five or maybe 10 miles. On the other side of the coin, you have the marathoners, which are running approximately 1,000 a, a miles or 1,600 kilometers. And those dogs are going to be burning somewhere between eight and 12,000 calories every day, which is roughly about 10,000 calories on average. And this is for a dog that weighs roughly 50 pounds. I'll back up just a moment to dispel another myth, of course, which is size. You, you didn't mention that, but it all kind of ties together. Most folks are just as surprised about the size of the dogs as you were surprised about how much fun the dogs have when they run in harness. Um, the dogs are small. The dogs are small, and they tend to be a little bit on the thin side, but these are thin athletes. And and if you look at, say, Michael Phelps, the great Olympic um, swimmer, and of course, there's I give you hundreds of other examples, but he's the first one that that pops to mind. Fairly long and lanky and and fairly thin. And um, very recent research has elucidated in the case of, of Michael Phelps that one of the reasons why he burned so many calories was because he was in the water, and water has what we call a a high specific heat, which means that it takes a lot of heat to warm water. And, and so his body was literally trying to heat up the swimming pool. So that's where, that's where part of his, um, where, where of his calories went. But he was burning a tremendous number of calories, too, in that 10,000, 12,000 range. But Mr. Phelps is over, uh, you know, close to 200 pounds. We're talking about dogs that weigh 50 pounds that are eating 10,000 calories a day. That's the rough equivalent of between 50 and 75 Big Macs every day for a human being in the 150 to 175 pound range for an average human being. So the dogs are eating a, a tremendous amount of food and they're eating that food for three reasons. One is because they're working very hard. They're running long distances, 100 miles a day. Two, they are doing it in cold temperatures and so a certain amount of that energy is used to help keep them warm. And three, what's also interesting, and we've learned this about human beings too and folks that are on weight loss diets, and that is that it takes energy to digest food. 
and so um, we have uh, we have uh, human beings that are encouraged to eat uh, more and smaller portions during the day, so that their digestive mechanisms in their bodies are are using a little more energy to digest the food, and that way they can burn more calories. My brother, he does not feed alfalfa to his horses in the winter time. He feeds hay because hay does not have as much energy as the alfalfa, so his horses are burning up more of this hay, trying to digest the hay, and that keeps the horses warmer. So hay is actually a little warmer in the winter than the alfalfa for my brother's horses. Well, now you get to these sled dogs, they're doing the same thing. They're eating two or three bigger meals a day. They're getting snacked on the trail every couple hours. There's this idea, you know, again, the, the, the misconception that the dogs are, are running endlessly like a, like a laboratory rat on a treadmill or something, and that's not the case at all. The dogs are running somewhere between one to two to four hours at, with, with breaks, and even with a four-hour um, break interval, there are smaller breaks in between where the musher stops the team, hops off, runs up, pets all the dogs, gives them all a little tiny tidbit of a snack, and, and, and they, they have a little chat, you know, they visit, and, and, and the, when the dog's tails are all wagging and they're all happy, then he hops back on the sled and away he goes, because attitude is incredibly important, and the food is part of that attitude. So these dogs are getting little snacks um, as they run, and and so they're they're using their body energy to digest the food that they're eating, as well as to pull the sled, as well as to stay warm. So they're getting lots of calories through the day in small meals. Now, I would not encourage the average pet owner to be feeding their dog 50 Big Macs a day, or the equivalent. It has to be matched to their to their exercise level. So step number one is, when it's winter, you can't be a couch potato, and your dog can't be a couch potato. You can read the sports page after the football game, but instead of watching it for three hours on Sunday, you can you can be out and, and doing something outside in the snow with your dog, and that's going to increase uh, the caloric level. And when you're snacking a little bit, that's good. When you're, And your dog can snack a little bit, that's good. It gets to be difficult, though, when you compare the, the, the racing sled dog who's snacking as they're running to the person who is continually snacking their dog that's laying in the house because it has these giant brown sad eyes looking up at you and, and laying this incredible guilt trip on you. And so there you are sneaking little bits of turkey under the table. That's not the kind of snacking I'm talking about. And, and I don't want to in, infer that, that therefore, if you're continually giving your dog little snacks while it's sleeping on your lap while you're watching the football game, that somehow it's going to lose weight by using the energy to, to digest the food. That's, that's not the same situation. So what we're talking about here is, is do, are dogs that are actually active and active dogs can be fed more than once a day and uh, or twice a day and and they can be snacked more often because these dogs these dogs are working long and hard and as i say they're burning around 10,000 calories they're drinking the equivalent of five gallons of water a day for uh, for a human being so they're consuming a lot of water as they run most of this water is not fresh water. Most of this water comes in what's called preformed water, which means the water is part of the food. It would be similar to opening up a can of Campbell's soup. If you read the label, it's about 70% water. So when you're eating Campbell's soup, it's a meal and it's hearty and it's healthy and all that. But if you read the label, you know you're, there's water in the can, plus you're probably adding more water to the saucepan on the stove and you're taking in your water as preformed water. Even a big juicy steak, that's where the word juicy comes from. Not only is there a lot of fat in steak, but there's a lot of water in steak. So a person who's eating a big juicy steak is actually taking in some water that way. So when we talk about these racing sled dogs, what they're doing is they're taking in an awful lot of their water through the food that they eat, which is usually a fairly sloppy, runny gruel, more of a, more of a stew or a soup, um, or a very runny Hungarian goulash rather than um, plain cold water. Most dogs in the wintertime, sled dogs, will not drink plain cold water. And so it's, it's kind of unfortunate because when I see a lot of folks that give advice to people about watering their dogs or, or you know, in the wintertime, they'll say, make sure your dog has plenty of access to fresh water. And while I certainly agree, I have to tell you, as they say, you can lead a horse to water, but you, you can't make him drink. And there are dogs and people like myself. Um, I'm not a water drinker in the wintertime. I'm, I'm hot chocolate or mulled wine or, you know, something. I don't like ice cold beer in the wintertime at all. That's a summer drink for me. I, I like warm milk, warm everything because it's winter. And many, many dogs are the same way. They, they need to have a little something with their water. So if you just give your dog fresh water and you turn around and walk away, 
and the dog doesn't drink the water because he doesn't like the water, you have a palatability issue that you're not even aware of. And so your dog has plenty of fresh water, but the dog is slowly dehydrating before your eyes. You might be feeding him a dry dog food, giving him fresh water that he's not drinking very much of. And so it's important that, that not only do you give your dog fresh water, but that you're satisfied that that fresh water is actually getting inside the dog. And that may require feeding a wet diet, um, a canned diet possibly, mixing canned with dry and, and pouring a little water on it. There's, there's different methods that uh, a pet owner can discuss with their veterinarian about making sure that not only does the dog have access to fresh water, but that the water actually gets inside the dog. So that's, that's, you know, that's the nutrition part of, of cold weather for these dogs. The, the sled dogs are eating a tremendous amount. They're drinking a tremendous amount. And what they're drinking is part of what they're eating. It's a consumption situation where both the water and the nutrients are coming in at the same time and in very large amounts to keep these dogs well hydrated and, and, and um, with a high level of nutrition for the work that they're doing. That's great information. So people who are in a colder environment, and maybe not even that cold environment in Southern California, you know, where I am, they can add water to the dog's food or maybe even spruce up the water with a little bit of bouillon or something that makes it a bit more palatable. But another thing I'd like to have you touch on is oftentimes people will look again at sled dogs and they're out in the dog yards and they have weird types of... Uh, dwellings for these dogs to be in and people look at oh my goodness this is so cruel these dogs are outside they're in these little hovels of a shelter and you know here is my own dog he's spending all this time indoors well yes a lot of dogs do spend time indoors but there are still those dogs that live outside what's important for someone to consider if they're going to have a dog outside during the winter with regard to shelter well, believe it or not, it's, it's actually fairly similar to, to human beings again, which is, you know, it should not surprise anyone that since they're the oldest domesticated animal and humans and, evo- and dogs have evolved along together for at least 14 to possibly 30 to maybe 100,000 years, that we should share a lot of those same kinds of likes and needs as well. And I'll talk again about myself for just a second. I do not like to be cold. Every now and then I'll hear someone say, oh, yeah, I, I like being cold. Well, they're not, they don't really mean that. You know, our bodies are designed to go at 98.6. We start to get down to 97, 96. We start to shiver, get hypothermic. We get a little too high. We, right away we turn on the air conditioner. We like to be right around a particular temperature that keeps our body core at 98.6. So no human being in his right mind likes to be cold, but that doesn't mean we don't like to be in cold weather. And cold weather is my favorite time of year. You know, I'll go camping at 50 below zero and have done so. But I'm camping at 50 below zero because I love cold weather, but I'm not cold. Dogs are the same way. Uh, you know, sled dogs, for instance, I don't know any dogs that like to be cold, but I know a lot of dogs that like to be in cold weather. And so with dogs or with humans, again, you have to kind of think along the same lines. How do you keep a dog happy and warm in a cold environment? I know folks that have dogs that they're outside, they look kind of unhappy, you know, they're pacing around. The person says, oh, the poor dog, he's outside, I'll bring him in. They bring him in the house, the dog's even worse. He paces around, he stares out the window, he starts to pant frantically because it's too hot for the dog. It turns out the dog would rather be outside and not inside, but they'd rather be outside and comfortable, not outside and uncomfortable, just like me. I'd rather be outside and comfortable in really inclement weather than not uncomfortable. You know the old saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Well, in the case of dogs, of course, clothing, you've got two options. There's the man-made clothing. There are jackets and there are little coats and there are little booties you can buy for the dogs. But a lot of it is just getting them acclimated with an undercoat. Some dogs, of course, genetically, some breeds do not have an undercoat. So there you have a problem. But, But we can address that separately. But dogs that do develop undercoats. Most of the working dogs certainly do, your German Shepherds and your Collies and and your Aussies and things like that, along with, of course, your northern breeds. Um, But uh, there's there's a lot of, of most of your hunting dogs, your Labs and your Chessies, of course, and they carry a little little bit more body fat, but again, that's another excuse. We'll go back to what we were talking about before. You you can't use the fact that a dog is a Lab for allowing it to be, you know, a a 150-pound Lab. (laughs) That little bit of fat helps keep them warm in the water, but not a whole lot of fat. These are are not whales. But anyway, getting back to back to the coat, it's the same thing. Whether it's a hunting dog or a working dog, uh, any of the sporting breeds, um, if, if they're outside and, and they are acclimated to the cold, they will their bodies respond to that and they will develop you know, a thicker coat and a heavier coat and that will help them outside. Um, the bigger problems are not so much the pure cold, but actually the wind and the rain. 
sitting up here in Minnesota, I look down at folks that live in Nebraska and Missouri, and I watch them getting 31 degrees in sleet when here it's 20 below. They feel sorry for me, but they don't understand that 20 below on a bright sunny day in Minnesota is actually gorgeous weather. It's almost shirt sleeve weather as long as the wind isn't blowing. And I look at folks that are at 31 degrees in sleet, and I think what could be possibly worse than at the edge of freezing and soaking wet. So when you look at a dog, it's the same sort of thing. You know, dogs that are in you know, a bright sunny day and they're outside in their kennel, even if it's cold, if the dog is outside, they're obviously not cold or they wouldn't be outside. And if they have a house, which we'll discuss, that, that, that keeps them warm, they'll go into the house because dogs aren't stupid. The dogs that I, concern, are, I worry about are the ones that are out there in the rain, and it's, it's windy, and it's 31 degrees, and it's right on that edge of, of, of miserable weather, which is exactly where I would not want to be, and it's where most dogs don't want to be, except, well, maybe the, the Labrador that likes being out in, in the duck hunting weather. My guest today is veterinarian Dr. Jerry Vanek. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. At Petco, we really love pets. There isn't anything we won't do to make sure they're getting the best products and the best care. So when you ask us a question like, So how do you feel about cat condos? We can say from experience, Feels like home. For her. Enter the code Dr. 10, D-O-C-T-O-R, the number 10, and get 10% off any order. No minimum at Petco.com. Hello? Danica, where have you been? Oh, Graham, I've been busy, you know, racing, GoDaddy girl. Oh, I built my own online store with GoDaddy. Really? Let me see. Grandma'sauction.com? Hey, aren't those Grandpa's golf clubs? Grandma needs her bingo money. Use promo code Dr. 10. D-O-C-T-O-R, the number 10, and get a .com domain name for just $7.49 at GoDaddy.com. If you ask the question, what do I want, what do I need, I'll take a back shot, I really should mention, I need time. Love My Pets, the new single by Mark Winter, available on iTunes. Ladies and gentlemen, Pet Life Radio proudly presents DSPN, the Dog Sports and Performance Network. Get ready to unleash the dog sports enthusiast in all of us. From speed drawing and mushing to racing, agility, and competition, this is the place to learn all about the dog sports and activities that you can do with your furry best friend and canine competitor. So get ready for game time. DSPN with your host, Lori Williams. Every week, on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Before the break, we were talking about shelters, and, and what you want to concern yourself with um, when you're looking at a shelter is obviously it has to be windproof, it, it should face 
the, the, the primary direction of the sun and, and should face um, uh, away from the primary direction of the wind. Winds will come in all directions, but at least in the, the, the mid-continental North America, the northwesterly winds, the northern northwesterly winds tend to be our cold winds. Um, northeasterlies tend to be a little rainier and, and, and wetter, whereas the northwest is usually a little cooler and drier. But again, it depends on what part of North America you live in. You're a but meteorologist most, most, also. I'm impressed. Yeah, most dog houses should be facing south and or southerly toward the sun and, and out of the wind. Um, it's nice to have a natural vegetative baffle. It's nice, to, just like with our own homes. Our homes have trees on the north and the west side, and our, our sunny views usually face sort of to the south. Um, that might might not be true in, in Arizona where it's really hot, but for much of the rest of the country, that's how we do it. Dogs are the same way. It, it's nice to have your dog houses set up a back with a backdrop of of uh, evergreens and, and, and shrubs and bushes and trees to break the wind to, to the north and west and, and the open part of the doghouse facing to the south. Um, and uh, at the dog houses, some, sometimes they, they have um, uh, covers over the doors, sometimes they don't. It depends on the dog. Um, if the, the, the dog house has a cover over the door, and the, some dogs will just tear the cover off and eat it. Um, other dogs uh, like being inside. Um, hay or straw, um, anything, any kind of bedding like that that's inside the house where the dog can curl up. How big should the dog houses be? Oftentimes people think that bigger is better, but I understand, especially if you're in a cold environment, you want to be able to trap some of that heat inside so you don't want it too large. You know, I'll give you a, a prime example, um, again, talking about human beings, because uh, we and our dogs are so closely related in so many ways. Um, I recently was, was camping um, with, with my, uh, my significant other, my partner, and she's also, of course, my administrative assistant and my supervisor and, and the boss of me. And so off we are, and she's considerably smaller than I am, and uh, she didn't have her sleeping bag with, but I had my two, and I, I've got these uh, two giant slumber jacks, and one is rated to 30 below, and one is rated to 20 below, and the 30 below one, of course, is larger. Me being the gallant man that I am, and knowing that a man can never score too many points, I gave her my larger slumber jack, which is rated to 30 below, and I took the smaller 20 below one. And, of course, I was extremely comfortable, and she froze. She froze in the larger sleeping bag that has a lot more loft, but it's longer and wider. And when she got inside the sleeping bag, she was basically sleeping in a cave, and her body couldn't heat up the sleeping bag because there was too much space. So then we traded it, and she took the smaller sleeping bag, which is not rated as cold, and I took the bigger sleeping bag. But because her sleeping bag was smaller and her body could fill up the sleeping bag, she was warmer. And so, yes, small size is, is not bad at all because, because just as with a mummy sleeping bag, if, if you're sleeping, you don't need to be sleeping in a cavern. You need to be sleeping in something small that's going to, that's going to maintain the body heat. So I particularly like smaller dog houses um, with the idea that dogs are outdoor critters. And when a dog goes into a dog house, it's normally not you know, to, to entertain the boss and the boss's spouse. <laughs> it's to sleep and, and not to have a party. And so a dog needs to be able to go into a smaller dog house and curl up in a nice bed of straw. And as I said a couple times, dogs are not stupid. You know, if the dog gets too hot, they'll go back outside. And I've seen dogs actually go in their dog house and dig all the straw out. And, and you know, after you get all done strawing it and you feel really good about yourself because you've done this wonderful thing for your loving pet, the dog goes in, digs all the straw out and sticks it in the middle of the yard and then crawls into the bare dog house. And, of course, you can, you can take that as an affront or an insult. But I tend to say to myself, oh, well, obviously... The dog didn't need all that straw at this particular point in time, which isn't to say that if the temperature drops another 20 degrees, they might not need it. So it's not as though I don't ever straw the dog house again. It's just I pay a little more attention to what the dog wants. And, and if the dog looks a little bit cold or whatever, they get more straw in their house. And, and at that point, maybe they get a little more food in their diet that it ups, their, ups their calories a little bit. Kind of you know, play it by ear, watch their, watch their body weight, watch the color of the urine in the snow, which is a beautiful thing about snow. Snow tells you about the hydration of the dog by the color of the urine. So um, if I've got nice clear urine like weak Gatorade, then I know my dog is well hydrated. And a well hydrated dog is warmer than a dehydrated dog, just as a well hydrated human is warmer than a dehydrated human. So I'm watching the urine and I'm watching the brightness of the dog's eyes and make sure they're sparkly and the dog's gums are wet and, and the urine is clear. And then I know the dog is well hydrated and I know he's well fed because I know what he's feeding him, what I'm feeding him. And then they've got straw in the house. So I know that they're going to be happy and warm in that house. A lot of people would say straw. Well, you know, I'll put some 
if it's not a musher, but to just a general pet owner will say, no, I'll put blankets out there. Blankets are going to be really good because it's a nice warm blanket instead of dumb straw. But in actuality, they're able to then snuggle down into that straw and have that airspace around them that keeps warmer. Isn't that correct? That's true. Um, and blankets have their place. Um, I, I must admit, I sleep with blankets and not with straw. Um, but that's <laughs> because you know, I, I have very, you know, I, well, I have very tender, sensitive skin, so the straw would itch. But, but in reality, um, you know, straw is something that, you know, again, working with mushers and dogs that live in the cold, I, I throw that out. I'm also a farm boy, and so it's easy for me to say that. I, I'm also aware that there are places in the United States where a bale of straw is probably 20 bucks. You know, <laughs> and it's like, you know, you could put your kids through college for what it costs to buy straw, and so. Uh, you know, I don't speak too lightly of that. There's, there's other things, sawdust. The main thing is, is some insulative form, certainly not fiberglass or any, anything that you would put in your house, but, but if you can't use straw, blankets are fine. The main thing with the problem with blankets is blankets oftentimes, uh, if, especially if they're made out of a cotton or a blend, they will crush down just as straw will. They can get some urine staining and things like that. And before long, you know, you have a wet blanket. And we all know what it means to throw a wet blanket on a happy person or a party, a celebration. It's the same thing. You don't put a wet blanket on a dog. And so if you're going to use blankets, there's not really anything wrong with them except neglect. You, you can't toss a blanket in the doghouse, walk away, and never look back. You have to be continually checking those blankets to make sure that they're, that they're, they're dry and warm and fluffy, which is, which is the insulated value of a blanket, just as with the human being. You, you want to sleep with a dry, warm, fluffy blanket, not with a soaking wet can and bath towel. Um, and so with dogs, the same way. And with straw, of course, also the same way. Straw is not a, a forever product. Periodically, the straw is, is crushed, it's damp, it's wet, it can even freeze in the bottom, and then you've got a mess. And so you have to be diligent about your dog's, uh, your dog's doghouse. Your mother made you make your bed every day when you got up, and, and there was a reason for that. And, uh, you know, you should, you know, do your, your laundry at least once a week or, or you know, once a year at least. <laughs> and so it's the same thing with your dog. You, you know, you, you, uh, you may not be making your dog's bed every day, but you want to be checking on the bedding in the doghouse to make sure that whether you're using a straw type material or a blanket type of material that it remains warm you know remains means remains dry and fluffy and and not um, wet and 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 crushed down and frozen because there's no insulative value in that kind of material for human or dog Dr. Jerry Vatic, you have some great information. We only have a few more minutes left. I would love to have you talk on some of the other precautions of winter, such as some of the toxins, things that dogs can get exposed to. So the antifreeze, the salt that they use to keep from slipping on the ice, those types of subjects. Can you touch on it very quickly? Oh, absolutely. There's really not too much to say about antifreeze. It probably hasn't already been said. And, of course, uh, nowadays with the Internet, you can Google a lot of those things. Antifreeze is highly toxic. It is an alcohol. And, and uh, depending on how much the dog drinks, and rather than get into you know, so many teaspoons for so many pounds of dog, I wouldn't do that. I would, I would simply say avoid, avoid um, antifreeze altogether, and that way you, you don't have a problem. So if you've got antifreeze dripping in your garage, um, then you certainly want to, you want to clean that up um, right away because it is, it is a, a sweet, sugary alcohol, and, and it's, it's, it's rather tasty to dogs, and, and they'll drink a little bit of it, and they can actually get drunk on it just as if they were drinking an ethyl alcohol like vodka or whatever. The problem is, is that after they start to sober up a little bit from that, then they have these crystals that form in their kidneys, which is the real problem because that can destroy the kidneys and the dog can die of renal failure. So the best thing is just not to have antifreeze spills at all. And if you're out with your dog and you see anything that looks suspicious, um, colored snow, anything that's in the, in the green, the yellowish green, that, that ten, it tends to be a, a type of antifreeze. There's also some sort of reddish maroon colored um, antifreezes. You definitely just want to stay away from those. Um, I won't get into the different of the, the camper, the, the Winnebago type antifreezes that, that you can you can put in, in water lines. So they, they also are, they're, they're, they don't destroy the kidneys, but they have toxins of their own. But then then of course there's the the windshield methanols, um, which interestingly apparently do not cause blindness in dogs as they do in humans. But the best thing is if it's any kind of a chemical that you use in winter for your car, for instance, whether it's an RV type antifreeze or a radiator antifreeze or the de-icer type of antifreeze, each one of those is a different kind of alcohol with a different kind of toxin. None of them are good for dogs. And so basically you want to stay away from, from colored snow, if at all possible. And if your dog is drinking some, 
while I don't advise people to, to panic, I think you should you know, contact your veterinarian, let them know approximately how much it was, and then they will advise you as to the, the, the degree of severity and if the dog needs to go in or not. But I would always err on the side of caution uh, if you find your dog drinking any kind of a colored liquid uh, in, in the wintertime. As far as the road de-icers, the primary problem there, of course, is the dogs are ingesting it off their body after they're on the ice. So if you're out jogging with your dog and it happens to be on a city street or sidewalk, a lot of times you'll see in the snow these little tiny circles where things have melted in. That's obviously uh, some type of a de-icer chemical. There can be a salt or other types of salt-like um, manufactured chemicals that are used to change the melting point of the ice and, and get it to melt so that people aren't slipping and, and, and harming themselves. But um, none of those, again, are, are healthy for dogs. And so uh, any dog that's, when you're out um, uh, jogging with your dog, um, skijoring is usually not a problem because, or snowshoeing because usually you're on fresh snow, you're on hard pack trails, uh, they're normally not putting any kind of de-icer on a, on a cross-country ski trail or out on a snowshoe trail. But if you're on a highway street, um, the local city sidewalks where you know that your um, community is, is actively de-icing for the safety of the public, then um, you need to be aware that your dogs are getting these on their feet. Certainly long-term, you can have some just normal skin abrasions from the, the chemicals, but more often than not, the dogs um, are going to be tidy about themselves. When they come back in, they might be licking their paws, and now they're ingesting these, these products. So the thing to do then is, is um, uh, use booties, of which there are many kinds. Some are very um, cheap, by the way. You can get on the Internet from, uh, again, uh, dog mushing organizations. Uh, there's, there's websites like Sled Dog Central and many others where you can order booties that the mushers use to run to, on the Iditarod from Anchorage to Nome a thousand miles and, and they're quite um, inexpensive compared to some of the pet store ones that get to be quite pricey. Um, but either way, regardless of your financial means, uh, if you want to use some type of booty or other on your dogs, get them used to them and have them running on these conditions where you suspect there might be chemicals on the road, then that would be the thing to do. If the dogs are running barefoot, then it's a matter of you know wiping off the paws um, uh, when you get back home and drying them out and uh, the dog comes inside if they've got food and they've got water and treats and things like that, they'll be less likely to lick their paws rather than something that's much more interesting uh, uh, to eat. The other thing that goes along with the winter, winter weather, of course, are things like holiday treats and, and those sorts of things. Um, um, they're not specifically weather-related, except that Thanksgiving happens to be uh, when winter starts to roll around and, and Christmas is getting into the middle of, of winter, as is, of course, New Year's, January. And then Valentine's Day, of course, um, there are lots of, of holiday foods between Halloween and Easter, which are sort of the brackets of, of winter weather, or, or at least um, colder fall and colder spring weather. So between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and, and Valentine's and Easter, we have ample opportunities to give our dogs um, lots of kinds of foods that they should not be eating. And we're all aware of, of, of the chocolates. Um, uh, poinsettia is not, not, is not terribly poisonous in and of itself, but it will cause mouth irritation. So it's listed as a poison, although it's not really a toxin. It's more of, of chewing on, on irritating leaves and things and, and uh, it's not, not something critical but it's nevertheless it's, it can be an annoyance for a dog that's, that's got a sore mouth but you've got other types of the turkey and the chicken bones and uh, the, 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 you've got the Halloween chocolates, you've got Christmas chocolates, you've got Valentine's Day chocolates, you've got Easter chocolates. You have things that are fatty and wonderful to eat so yes, it's Basically, really cute. right. Right. And the only other thing would be the xylitols, which are uh, those folks that are going sugar-free and, and you have to kind of watch and see whether it's a NutraSweet or what type of, of, of sugar-free product it is. And xylitol can be quite toxic in dogs. Um, and, uh, and so uh, make sure that, that if your dog is accidentally ingesting a type of sugar-free candy that, uh, that, that it's not a, a xylitol type because there again, you would want to be checking with your veterinarian um, right away if your dog not only snarfed up you know, a box of chocolate, but it was chocolate with um, xylitol artificial sweetener. It's sort of a double whammy there. So. Dr. Jerry Vanek, I can tell we could keep going on for hours. You have wonderful information. Hopefully people who've been listening to Dave realize, yes, dogs and themselves can have some good exercise during the winter. No reason to pack on those pounds. I appreciate all your information. It has just been very enlightening and very entertaining. So we've been listening to Dr. Jerry Vanek. I'm Dr. Bernadine Cruz with The Pet Doctor. Thank you so much for listening. Please listen again next week. When we'll have more information to make you the best possible pet owner that you can be no matter what the season. Thanks for listening. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. 
Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.